we're concluding chapter six today. Uh, it, we've been on a nice little roll, it seems like, where we do two sessions on a single chapter. And so today we're going to conclude chapter six uh, in uh, Crossan's uh, The Greatest Prayer, which is looking at, of course, at what we know of as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, remember, our background is that this, this Abba prayer that Paul is familiar with Right. And remember also, Paul is one of the earliest, is the earliest writer we know for the New Testament writing somewhere, probably in the 50s, uh, uh, but makes reference to this Abba prayer. And, uh, <clears throat> and you, some of you know about the Jesus seminar. And one of the things that we're pretty certain of is that when Jesus was teaching, uh, he did refer to God as Abba, Father, which was a... Uh, a rather intimate way of knowing God. Paul was aware of that prayer, and it, he said it was the prayer that it, we are, that, that re really represents collaboration in some ways, that we as, as humans, uh, we don't know how to pray to God, so it's the Spirit who must uh, pray for us and pray with us, we might say. That prayer comes to be elaborated uh, in a kind of, um, faith statement, we might say, uh, that we find in uh, Mark, <clears throat> excuse me, in Mark and Matthew and Luke. Um, now I'm starting to wonder, yeah, it, it is in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Uh, I, I always have to re remind myself, uh, but we're talking about the Lord's Prayer and just in its barest, barest uh, bears form, you know, bare bones form, talks about God and human beings and this collaborative relationship between God, God, whose kingdom is, whose kingdom on earth uh, is one of justice and equity, and God who, if we're going to use metaphors about God, the father metaphor, it has become kind of, if I can use the word stale, uh, you know, we, we say it and, and it doesn't really it it does doesn't really gr grip us the way that some you know good metaphors do because it's been used for what twenty centuries now. So Crossan is using this term, this metaphor of of God the Father as a householder. He's really elaborating this idea of what it means to be a father, and in the Jewish tradition, the householder was one who took care of the family, you know, made sure that there was equitable distribution of resources, made sure that everyone was treated in a, in a just way. And so we're not really moving away from God the Father, we're just adding a new dynamic to this idea. And, and Crossan is gonna come back to this again and again and again, because he expects us as individuals, and he expects the church as the body of Christ to act in the same way. Uh, to be guided by the same principles as the Jewish householder himself. So we, we saw last time the structure of the prayer, the first half having to do with God, and the second half in which we have just embark, embarked, uh, having to do with our role in this collaborative uh, endeavor uh, in establishing the kingdom of God. And the first thing that the prayer refers to is something that I think, uh, it, Constance, I think especially of, of your uh, new undertaking with the bridging forward, this idea of meeting and sharing a meal and how important that is to the early church. And it was a political statement in many ways in, in the early church. And it's at this point, I, I I'd like to, you know, reflect a little bit. I can't remember if I did this last time, but, you know, we we have a, in in session, for example, there are some people there who say, well, I, we don't want our statement to become too political, right, uh, as, as the church. We don't want to get involved in politics. And when, when people say that, they usually mean we don't, you know, we, we don't want to come across as uh, supporting one political party over another. But in the more general sense of the term, uh, the polis in Greek was 
considered in many ways a, a, an organism that had to be maintained and the health of that organism needed to make, be maintained by the responsibility of its citizens. The, uh, the, the Romans had a similar idea with civitas. And of course, the emphasis there was making sure that you, you followed the laws. And these, you know, these ideas have followed us all the way up to the 21st century, where, you know, the, the Greek and Roman ideals of what political or civic life were meant to be have, have brought us to this very point. Now, what, what the, and please remember this as we move into our, <laughs> uh, as we move into our political season of voting. But the response I'd like to make is that the church, if it is to follow the Lord's prayer as it is prayed every week or every day, every week in church, certainly, cannot help but be political. And by that, I do not mean cannot help but be Republican or cannot help but be Democratic, but cannot help but have a foothold in the world itself because the kingdom of God deals with uh, you know, the material needs of that world. We're looking at bread in this chapter. And we're looking, we'll be looking at debt, money in the next chapter. And we will be looking at the allure of, you know, the material things in this world that can office, uh, often distract us from uh, pursuing that kingdom of God. But that, you know, being concerned with, equal distribution of, of, uh, of material goods, equal distribution of food, that is a political act. In the most general philosophical sense of the word, the, the church is a political organization, not democratic or Republican nevertheless, but also not some ethereal type of community whose concerns are only spiritual. We are part of the polis. We are part of the civitas uh, that uh, <clears throat> that Jesus demonstrated, you know, when he was alive, and demonstrated in no uncertain terms. I mean, he uh, and his disciples. Jesus taught his disciples to speak truth to power. I mean, to use a, a common uh, common uh, sentence that we often often hear to oppose not just with your words, but your actions, what we believe to be injustices, inequitable treatment of people in the world. It was a very um, egalitarian movement that Jesus uh, was espousing and Jesus was teaching. And at its core was one of the most, uh, you, you know, uh, rudimentary parts of what it means to be human, and that is uh, feeding, food. And it was especially help, you know, important at the time, as we discussed last time. You might remember, you know, under the control of the Romans, and especially under the uh, oversight of the king, literally the king of the Jews, the, the Roman uh, representative Antipas, uh, Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great. Herod had, you know, his great programs for really making himself wealthy and making Rome wealthy. And he was going to do it on the backs of those in his tetrarchy. He was the tetrarch of uh, Galilee, where Jesus was from. And this is one of the great insights that that I really am thankful for with, with Crossan. Crossan wants to make clear that Antipas or Antipas, Herod Antipas, I've heard it pronounced both ways. Herod Antipas was basically exploiting the resources of the land, which, you know, belonged to the people. There is this, you know, the this this commons idea. The air we breathe, the fish in the sea, the waters in the lake belong to all, all people. Uh, but what Herod wanted to do was commodify these, uh, tax them, put the burden on the people for the taxes, put the burden on the people for the work, but don't give them the results of their labor. 
and things have not changed that much in the 2000 years since, have they? But this is precisely the kind of manipulation of resources of God's creation, of God's you know, creation of human beings that Jesus wanted to oppose. This is the, if I could say political, in the general sense of the word, the political movement that Jesus was teaching. And it had to do with bread, and it had to do with wine, we'll see, and it had to do with fish. Uh, Crossan makes the point, you know, why is the New Testament, why are the Gospels, I should say, so fishy? You know, what is all this discussion about fish? You know, even in the early church, the fish came to be uh, a sign of the movement, the ichthos uh, in Greek, uh, the became an acronym for Jesus Christ God's son, savior, ichthus. Uh, and, you know, we still see it on the backs of uh, our uh, vehicles today, you know, the, the Christian fish. But well, what is this all about? Well, it had to do with the real problem of the goods, the common goods of God's creation, the common goods of the household being exploited, manipulated, taken away and moved off to Rome uh, at the expense of the people themselves. So when we 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 think about you know Christianity as this, just a spiritual movement that has nothing, very little to do with you know getting involved in justice issues, things like that. You just can't uh, you can't justify it. Not when we know the context as what is what Crossan has been uh, presenting to us. So that's where we were. Uh, last time are there any questions or comments about that uh dan yeah danny Just please comment about uh you know the commons and you know fish and bread and uh, flipping back to the last two thousand years most land was in many ways uh held in commons uh not all of it by any stretch but with low right. populations in the in the world, it's really not until what the uh, 1600s, 1700s in Europe that in the enclosure movement, you know, really began to shrink the land available, and thus okay. the arrive the the rise of cities. Yeah, partially the rise of cities. Uh, so this, this concentration thing, you know, is really kind of almost linked to population. And resources and surplus. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, <clears throat> what a, the religion really has tr two trajectories here. We can e ignore it and try to imagine that our life is is ultimately spiritual, and that we deny the body. And and there were many, especially in the Hindu religion, you know, the uh, the yogis, for example, who followed that path. That has nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity has to do with, you know, uh, speaking truth to the power that is, you know, bringing this uh, injustice into the world. Um, has to do with bread, multiplying loaves and fishes. And, and Crossan kind of jumps off from the miracle that we find, you know, several places in the Gospels, but it's really the only miracle that is in all four of the Gospels, which should tell us something, sometimes twice. It's in Matthew uh, twice, you know, this, this feeding idea. And, and one thing I don't think I emphasized enough the last time, and I, I have a... Uh, Kind of a running disagreement it, and it almost and it, it hurts a friend a friendship that i have with somebody you know rather conservative uh but she sees that the import of this story as being an affirmation of what god is capable of doing what jesus was capable of doing right jesus took these things and literally multiplied them and fed everybody Right. A miracle happened, a miracle, something that that transgressed the laws of physics took place and the people were able to be fed. Now, think about the ramifications of this. OK. Um, by contrast, 
Crossan says, this is a miracle parable. This is a story about, uh, this is a story told in parabolic fashion that has import for the way we live our lives today. The disciples don't know what to do. They want to feed the people. Jesus says, you feed them. And out of the small amount of bread that is there, actual bread. Now, as the story is told in Mark, there are a lot of uh, suggestions that this is another example of, you know, Moses in the desert. But Jesus doesn't expect manna to fall down from heaven, right? He says, you feed them. And it's actual bread. It's actual food that gets distributed and divided. This is the lesson, you know, that we distribute equally. And this is the vision that Jesus wants to establish. Um, and <clears throat> this is also going to play a role in the early uh, rituals of the church, as we will will find out. So, um, and here's here's where I left off last time. Cross and reads Mark's parable to say that there's more than enough food already present upon the earth. Boy, we know that's true, right? And bread for the world has make has made this clear to us many times over. More than enough food already present on the earth when it passes through the hands of divine justice. When it is taken broken and given out when food is seen as God's consecrated gift, the now present kingdom of God is about the equitable distribution of our earth for all. Jesus simply enacts that parable of God as householder of the world. Jesus makes manifest this idea that when God, the householder is, you know, in control of the world, <laughs> uh, then food will be equitably distributed. And this is our task, is to bring that uh, new vision about. Um, well, Crossan moves on. He's going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the political ramifications of this. And I won't focus too much on John 21 because he really spends more, Crossan spends more time on Luke 24. But the John 21 story is one that's very, curious it is the conclusion of the gospel of john and you might remember it in 21 verse one or four somewhere around there uh it, it's after the resurrection it's after the story where jesus you know comes into the house even though the doors are locked and he breathes on them and says peace be with you and it's after Thomas places his hands into the side of Jesus. This is the conclusion of the Gospel of John. Peter, James, and John, you know, the fishermen are back at the lake, you know, trying to wonder, you know, should can we go back to our old jobs again? And remember the political ramifications of that. These are guys going back to work basically as indentured servants or slave labor for the Romans. And Peter says, heck with it, I'm going fishing. And the, the other disciples say, well, we're coming with you. And they don't catch anything the whole time they're out there fishing. And then as they're coming into shore, they see someone on the shore that says, hey, you haven't caught anything, have you? And they say, no. And then this person who we know to be Jesus, but they do not, says, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And they do. And they haul in this really strange number of fish, 153. And, and Crossan doesn't, Crossan doesn't really pay much attention to that because there are so many varied interpretations. One of the interpretations is that it, it is a, a secret Pythagorean symbol or number that, you know, uh, is a key to the whole Pythagorean background of the Jesus movement. And Crossan is right not to emphasize that because what he really wants to emphasize is the idea that this miraculous catch is a affirmation of the idea that is so central that this lake, the Sea of Galilee, though in the beginning of John around verse one to four or so, it, it's called the Sea of Tiberias. And there's an irony to that, right? Because 
why would you call it the Sea of Tiberias if your whole movement is about taking the sea back, taking the Sea of Galilee back for, for God? But that's the ironic aspect of it. The Sea of Tiberias is once again in the kingdom of God uh, brought back into the fold of the household of God. On the Sea of Tiberias, there is emptiness of nets. On the other side of the boat, so to speak, on the Sea of Galilee, in, in the household of God, there is abundance for, for all. And this is, uh, this is the whole focus on, on fish. It is a real political statement. We want to take back the lake as a microcosm of the world. And this is the role that the church, following the teaching of Jesus, is to play. Um, any any comments about that? Have you ever thought about that 153 fish idea? It's a it's a funny one for sure. Well, one of my favorite stories, uh, <clears throat> because I remember even even when I started studying religion as a freshman in college, you know, I'd, I'd always read the Bible, but started uh, thinking about interpretation of, of religion and uh, ter interpretation of the Bible. Uh, it seemed like this story of the road to Emmaus was so clear <laughs> in terms of the import of what it was trying to say. And it's so simple that even a you know a freshman at uh, at Hope College where I was could figure it out you know and and could see very clearly what uh, was being said. You probably know the story, and this is the story in Luke. There are many resurrection stories, right? Some of them take place in Jerusalem. Some of them take place in Galilee. Uh, some of them you know take place on the Sea of, of Sea of Galilee. Uh, but this is a story that happens on the day after, uh, well, it would be the day of the res resurrection or shortly after the crucifixion, when two disciples are going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Emmaus, as I understand it, is about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. And they're <clears throat> walking along the road and they're rather dejected. And a third person uh, comes into the uh, situation and says hey you guys look kind of down what's going on and they said well we we had hoped that jesus who was just crucified a few days ago we, we thought he was going to be the messiah and it turns out that that he he was not you know he he didn't bring in that glorious kingdom of god that that was represented by the kingdom of david in the in the old testament we're still under the romans life still stinks uh we, we are still under the boot of our oppressors right and then jesus starts to talk to them a little bit and says yeah maybe you're not looking at this uh as symbolically as you should and then he opens up the scriptures you know uh, symbolically i should say i'm speaking metaphorically here he starts with Moses and the prophets, and he starts to walk through all of these things and explain to them why such and such, you know, uh, uh, such an execution must happen in order to fulfill the law and the prophets. But here's the thing. These two disciples, one by the name of Cleopas and the other who is not named. And Crossan makes a very good point here because it's never represented in Christian art. But often it was the case that the other person, if they were not named, would be the wife of the disciple. No need to, to name you know, the wife because she's represented by Cleopas anyway. So Crossan makes a really interesting point. It, this could be man and wife, you know. Uh, this could be two married people who were early followers of Jesus. They're on the road. They still don't get it. Jesus unfolds all of the prophets and his preaching, so to speak, his proclamation does not do anything to their, their hearts. But then they get to their house, as this icon represents here, and Jesus says, well, it's been nice. I, I guess I'm, you know, 
my path has taken me elsewhere. And they do the thing that is is implied in their faith, right? Come join us. Be a, you know, you, you must be hungry. Let us show you hospitality. Let us break bread with you. And they go into the house and they sit down on either side of Jesus. And as Jesus breaks the bread, all of a sudden their eyes are open. And for a brief moment, they see Jesus as he truly is. And so there are, there's a lot that's happening here, but Crossan wants to make the point that it, you know, you can preach all you want. <laughs> you can proclaim all you want, but the place where the Christian message really comes to bear, where it really becomes evident, is when the preaching is followed up by the breaking of the bread. Those two have to go hand in hand. Preaching without bread is not effective. Bread without preaching does not bring about the kingdom of God, does not add that extra dynamic of meaning to sharing food. It's just something right? But those two have to go hand in hand. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our spiritual as well as our material uh, sustenance on this day. Now, I, I think that's wonderful. And the, the reason I like the story so much, because I, I had that aha moment when I was, what, 19 or 20 years old. It's just like these two things have to go together. If, you, if you're if you just preaching the word and not feeding the poor, then Jesus is not recognizable. Then the body of Christ does not become the true body of Christ. It becomes just kind of this spiritual abstract entity. And so um, very important, I think, for us to keep in mind, because this is also the foundation of the standard ritual of the early church. And that's where Crossan wants to go next in, in the following paragraphs. But any any thoughts about that? Now, Constance, I, I, I think about our endeavor with uh, bridging forward and how uh, Al, when you were reading this, you probably took meaning from it. At least I think I think you would if you were reading. Yes, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah, and I I think we all you know represent uh, we all kind of recognize just simply as a human act, uh, sharing food is, is something that helps us transcend transcend ourselves. You know uh, that that really uh, establishes our true humanity and then connect that with what Jesus was trying to do. And, and, and it becomes uh, very theologically sound for us. Any, any thoughts about this or comments? I just thought it was real whammy. <laughs> whammy. What do you yeah. mean? Oh, just, Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it just yeah. Was very meaningful. And this really, like I, we say, in the early church, this ritual was practiced. You would read the scriptures and there, and then you would share food. It's worked a little bit to our disadvantage that over time, you know, when things became so unruly, you know, especially after Constantine, when you had a whole, uh, a whole empire, a whole empire to feed, that the bread and the wine started to take on these symbolic characteristics, as well as eventually uh, a representation of the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And we, lost the whole sustenance, the daily bread aspect of that. But I, I love the summary that uh, Crossman makes on page 134, right down at the bottom. Uh, of all the many things Jesus did before his resurrection, it is that multiplication of bread and fish and the invocation of those four verbs, take 
give thanks, break, and distribute. Uh, in Mark, that reappears as bread and fish in John 21. It's the same, it's the same thing. We, we're feeding. We're equally distributing uh, the material goods of God's creation. And it's those four verbs in Luke 24. Why is that important? There is, I think, a confrontational edge to that emphasis on fish. It is not a passing criticism of Antipas, Antipas from the earthly life of Jesus, but involves what Jesus is and ever remains as the revelation of God. It is not just this political confrontation. It is the foundation of the church. It is to repeat about Galilee's lake as a microcosm of God's world. Who owns it, controls it, distributes it. Furthermore, that distribution is by sharing, even with, or especially with, the random stranger, as happens in the Emmaus uh, story. Only then, only in the sharing, is Jesus still present in the Christian community. That's a pretty bold statement. If you have a Christian community where the sharing is not taking place, then Jesus is not present. I think there would be many today who would, would want to challenge that, to be sure. And so um, I wanted to just take a little excursus here uh, and, and reflect a little bit on this road to Emmaus. You all probably know this, uh, this painting, right? It's probably one of the kitschiest things you've you've encountered i grew up with this painting as a little presbyterian acolyte in the church you know and i thought thought it looked so wonderful it's so so beautiful there's a big this is a, a sycamore tree and i grew up with sycamore trees or it looks a lot like a sycamore tree but what's wrong with this painting <laughs> This looks like the ideal landscape of Germany, indeed, but it's not the ideal landscape of, of uh, you know, of Palestine at this time. This painting, as common as it has become, look at when it was painted. It was 1877. This would have been right in the midst of the whole German Romantic movement, which, unfortunately, one arm of it gave rise to... Uh, what we know today as, as white supremacy and this focus on Jesus as a white Aryan uh, God whose original home was in Germany. And so this, con this, this painting really represents in many ways this connection between Germany, the fatherland, and Jesus, the God of, you know, the fatherland, the two of them going hand in hand that, you know, eventually Hitler would make uh, official, there would be an official German church, you know, that had Hitler as the, uh, you know, the center of that church. Uh, but when this was being painted, Hitler was still 70, 80 years away, or 50, 60 years away. Um, but it just shows how, you know, one of these stories can be completely misconstrued and end up through visualization, uh, making a point that's utterly contrary uh, to the intention of the story itself. And there, were, there was something else I was thinking of. Well, let me let me stop and see what what type of feeling does this uh, image evoke uh, in you, if any? Maybe it's one that I'm just familiar with from my, my childhood. Very idealistic, uh, very lovely, you know. Um, Dan, Jesus yeah. doesn't have blonde hair. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that interesting? Well, uh, other, others have corrected that deficiency for us many times, you know, even the blue eyes at times. Uh, but you're right. There's something else I wanted, I, I thought about, and that's the story of Emmaus and the two disciples. Here on the left is a, an icon of the, the Emmaus Road story. 
And the disciples here are both males as evidenced by their beard. You know, obviously the icon painter uh, or the icon writer as they're referred to uh, did not have Crossan's insight that Cleopas's uh, companion could have been his wife. But as I look at this icon and I think about how the story has been represented uh, in art here, Jesus is breaking bread and the important thing here that, that Crossan wants to point out, the breaking of the bread is, is really important. Not everybody just doesn't have their own little piece, but it is the sharing, the breaking that allows for the distribution and for the, the communal meal. And it, it is in this, as we've already said, that, that, that the body of Christ or Christ becomes present. It's really interesting how this icon to me, I should say, it's interesting. And, and note also how the fish is present here. The small fish on the table, right? Uh, it's interesting to me how this story is represented in such a way that it recalls another famous story in Genesis. And that is uh, represented here on the right by what's known as Rublev's Trinity. Uh, probably the most famous icon from the, we think the 10th century of the common era, but it is a story about Abram and Sarai. I don't, can't remember if their names had been changed just yet. I think it's in Genesis 18, 19, somewhere around there, but they are, they have their tents, you know, pitched there under the Oaks of Mamre and they see, you know, these three characters coming along the road and Aram says, Hey, quick, quick, go and, you know, get things ready. Let's, let's show them our hospitality. And, and they do that, right. They, they feed these people on the road. And it, it is only later that we find out that these people are God. It's God and two angels, but later on in Christian theology, it's represented as God in, in Trinity. But it's in the hospitality, it is in the breaking of the bread that happens under the oaks here with Abraham that God is also revealed as well. So I wonder if there's any connection between, you know, this Emmaus Road story and connections that could be made all the way back to the very beginning in Genesis, where the focus is. In the showing of hospitality, God can be known. In the breaking of bread, God can be known. It's an Old Testament Jewish idea as well as a New Testament kingdom of God idea. So thank you for letting me demonstrate that. But I'm just like, I don't know, this time it really hit me. Like This is like Rublev's Trinity, really. It really looks very much like that. Any, any thoughts on that? I'm sure you know the story. Well, Dan, I'd have just a comment. I mean, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> when I was learning, when I was learning uh, more than 50 years ago, um, one of the concepts that was given to all of us, and I don't know if Sharon's even here today, but she probably would remember this, was the concept that in the Jewish tradition, the taking of a meal with someone was a much more intimate and important and significant act than it is, say, if I just have you over for dinner. Yeah. If I, you know, 2,000 years ago in a Jewish household, if you had dinner with someone, that was a very communal event and a very significant event, which is probably why the, the Last Supper yeah. concept, the Eucharist, developed. Um, and so I guess you're... Old Testament icon, you know, may, to me at least, relates to that sort of thinking. Yeah, yeah. And and I I don't want to lose that in, you know, the Last Supper either. I think, you know, if we want to, if we want to talk historically about this, probably what happened in, to uh, minimize the, the, the meaning and power of that is that 
sharing a meal in Roman society where, you know, the Christianity is developing was usually about a this some sort of display it was making some sort of statement where the focus wasn't so much on i am feeding and i'm being with you but look at what i'm doing for you you know and there was a whole hierarchy that took place within that you had people who ate the good stuff you had other people who were you know freed slaves who ate you know just the the standard fare right you know uh but but that jewish aspect of <clears throat> well, apart, you know, forgive me if this is too crass, but apart from uh, the intimacy that takes place in sexual union, probably the most intimate thing you can do to know somebody, and that that term in Hebrew is often used in a very dynamic sense to mean to really come to uh, an intimate understanding of the other person. Apart from the sexual act, probably the most intimate act that we can engage in as human beings is sharing food. Because in the true sharing of it, you are you're you're all touching the same bread, you're all drinking from the same cup, as we know from you know uh, from scripture. Uh, and so trying to hold on to that aspect of the the, the, the so-called Lord's Supper, that is the supper that the Lord would have us eat. Um, I would also, you know, I, I'm certainly no expert on this. I know there are people in this group that know more about this than I do. But, you know, the mo the important holiday of Passover, I yeah. mean, Passover meal is, to my understanding, really important part of the ritual oh absolutely and it, it's an important part of the ritual because there is a story and identity that goes along with meal you're not just eating the meal you're eating it in a ritually prescribed way now we tell the story and 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 you're 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 informing and teaching your children about you know the the seminal event the the primary event that made the jews who they are and you know and this represents the mortar that we had to use to in making and building and this represent uh, represents our tears as we we lived as slaves and in that telling of the story I, identity is established right and i think it's probably true when it's not the passover meal what do we do what do we do when we eat with each other? Um, we, you know, I think of meals that, that I've shared with Harvey and Constance, for example. Uh, we don't just come in, eat, and leave, right? Uh, they take they take hours. I'm sitting there looking at my watch, thinking, "Oh my gosh, how long is this going?" No, I'm just kidding. I never say that. They take hours. Why? Because we're feeding each other not just the food that we're sharing, but we're feeding each other. We're revealing aspects of our, of our innermost selves, you know? And uh, I, I think this is the sense that, that we have in, you know, the Lord's Supper. I mean, Jesus was revealing to his disciples the death that was about to take place in no uncertain terms. My body's going to be broken. My blood is going to be spilled, right? Uh very meaningful that that meals form the foundation for that. Um, any other thoughts on this? Uh, and Dan, I got to thinking that one of the truly marvelous things about a shared meal is it's a truly transformative event in terms of transforming, you know, the the fresh food into a shared meal. You know the, the the whole preparation process is is part of what you're kind of right. giving us for that almost magic of being able to do that. Right, right. Uh, I mean, I mean, when you're invited to somebody's house or you invite someone, you, you are telling them, uh, "I'm anticipating this. I'm looking forward to this with great anticipation, and I want this to be special. You are special to me." And I want to demonstrate that by the care that I take in preparing this meal. 
I I thought I heard this from uh, Tom. Um, what's our glass blower, Tom? Can't remember Tom's last name. Uh, the whole thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh yes, yeah. Well, Tom. Um, he was in Japan. And I, I'm sorry, I couldn't remember his name. I, I'm having these senior moments, or let's call it COVID fog. But he spent some time in Japan, and I thought I heard this story from him. And then later on, several years later, I told him, remember that story you told? He said, I, ne I never told you that story. <laughs> no, that's not true. But I like the idea that in Japan, when you are uh, preparing for a meal, you will make these little origami um, cranes, you know, and you will make a hundred of them and you will set them around the house. This being a representation of the idea that you are, you, you have been thinking about this meal. You have held them in your, in your heart as, you know, their, their time for arrival has approached. You know, so not only does the meal represent, you know, your care and concern for them, but also the time that you spend thinking about them as represented by these little origami cranes that are, you know, spread about the house. Um, I think that's beautiful, right? Um, too bad it's not true, according to Tom. Um, well, I, I do wanted to mentioned here that you know this uh as as crossin does as well the bread and fish do come to be represented in the bread and wine as well and, and why is the wine so important and and this is where crossin uh makes a nice transition tra transition in that you know if we go back to mark six where jesus is breaking bread and pouring wine he says this wine is the the blood of the covenant you know which is poured out for you the representation being i jesus am willing to die for this justice i for, for justice for the distribution among other things of food uh in the world which belongs to god the householder and in drinking the wine itself you take on the very role that that I have died for. You take up the cross, so to speak. Remember Jesus talking to his disciples, are you willing to take up the cross? Oh yeah, Jesus, we'll do whatever. No, it, it usually means you are going up against an opponent, Rome in this case, who responds violently and without forethought of pity or anything like that. Are you committed enough to this idea to this vision of the kingdom to take up that cross. And this is what the blood represents. It is not a sacrifice that somehow reconciles us to God. It is a sacrifice in the respect that it is asking of us to take on a sacrifice. You know, the breaking of the bread, the sharing of the communal meal also has ramifications because it runs up against the status quo of the world, which runs by violence and selfishness and greed and competition and all of those things that are diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God. Um, and I guess I've got a few minutes left to uh, talk about this. Crossan talks about the importance of this for Paul. Because Paul was working among Gentiles in what's known as you know, present-day Turkey and in Corinth, which was a very you know, wealthy city. It was a port city. There were you know, boats, and it was a very multicultural city. But what was happening there is that, <clears throat> excuse me, what was happening there is that they were celebrating, they were observing the Lord's Supper but undermining the meaning of that by holding on to Roman social cues. In Roman society, as, as we know from various writers, 
Pliny the Elder, for example, uh, and others, when a banquet was given, it was a demonstration of your wealth in many ways. And there were hierarchies of people. There were certain people who could sit close to you at the table and would eat the best food and drink the best wine. And then there are others that were in your social orbit, you know, that that had the kind of the lower fare, you know, eating the frozen dinners instead of the, you know, the <laughs> the, the fresh, uh, the meat, you know, that had been sacrificed, that kind of thing. And what was happening in the Corinthian church is that they wouldn't wanted to sell, celebrate or observe the Lord's Supper, but they were holding on to that Roman idea of, of social hierarchy within the meal. And this really got Paul just really, really upset. He's, you know, and he writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and I'm reading from this on page 157. Paul's not pleased. When you, Corinthians, come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? So what was happening is the people would get together, the rich would get together and, you know, go to their country club and eat the nice filet mignon and crab cakes and whatever like that. You know, there wasn't a country club, there wasn't filet, but, you know, I'm elaborating a little bit here. And then they would come to church, some of them already drunk, and then sit with the unwashed, so to speak, uh, sit with the, the lower echelon of society and then observe the so-called Lord's Supper which was no observation whatsoever. And this is where Paul says, remember now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you a little something because what I'm teaching you is what I have heard and what I've learned from Christ himself. I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Now, this is a representation of what the Lord's Supper was most likely originally celebrated uh how it was originally celebrated in the early church there would be a time that would people would come together they would hear the word spoken bread would be broken symbolically then there would be a meal where everybody in the church shared the bread that was broken shared a meal and then the ritual pouring of the wine so the supper takes place, it's smack dab in the middle of the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the wine. It really is a far cry from what we do when we pinch a little piece of bread and, and drink a little bit of grape juice. It is a communal meal where, where, where food is shared, uh, where everybody eats in the same way. And so let me read again on page 137, then we'll conclude with this that sequence of first the bread is body then supper and finally the wine blood wine is blood puts the supper in the middle says crossing the halves cannot come and have their better supper first and then celebrate the eucharistic meal with whatever bread and wine is left over that's not a possibility the full and very real supper is in the center of the symbolic ritual where everybody partakes. From bread and fish to bread and wine, from the life to the death of Jesus, from before to after the resurrection, it is always about God's food and God's world for God's people. All of that is packed into the simple challenge of give us this day our daily bread. 
the Lord's Supper is already present in the Lord's Prayer. So with that, I do want to, to, to conclude this chapter. I'm going to probably talk a little bit about, you know, the Exodus story when we meet the next time. But we're finished with chapter six. Um, and we'll pick up with set, chapter seven the next time. So um, I hope this has done two things. I hope when we pray the Lord's Prayer in church on Sunday, that, you know, the scent, the effervescence, the, the, the dynamics of what we've been talking about in this book inform that experience of praying the prayer. And the other thing I would hope that would happen would that, you know, the next time you are invited to a meal or next time you, you know, invite others to a meal, uh, think about the intimacy of that and how that is representative of what Christ tries to establish in the kingdom of God. You are the householder when you are giving the meal. You are equitably distributing uh, the food and affirming the goodness, not only of the food, but of those who are eating it. And, and hopefully this is what we don't do. This is what I don't do very well. Hopefully our social cast doesn't make this an exclusive meal. I think this is where we probably need to do the most work. I'll speak for myself it's where I need to do the most work. So that having been said, um, I hope you uh, have a good weekend. It's the busiest weekend of the year for us here, right? Because we're doing a graduation. And then after that, summer is here for the faculty. So. Uh, thank you all, and I will see you next time when we will start reading chapter 7.